Hello everybody. These days, if somebody comes to me asking what sensible car they should buy, it is very difficult to look past a Kia. Their combination of practicality, technology and price is difficult to beat. But I understand not everybody wants to say, I drive a Kia. So what do you buy if you want something sensible, practical and you want to say, I drive an Alfa Romeo? Mention modern day Alfa Romeo to even a casual petrol head, and the thing they'll most likely talk about is the Giulia Quadrifoglio, the 503 horsepower Ferrari engine derived super saloon. However, truth be told, even the regular Giulia isn't the one people went and bought. They picked up the Stelvio, the 4x4, and they didn't go for the hot one. Instead, the most popular trim for many markets is something like this the 280 horsepower Veloce. So, is this still good enough to justify the asking price in the face of so much very worthy competition? The Stelvio landed, believe it or not, way back in 2017. Now, I hate to tell you, five years ago. It spun off the same Giorgio platform that gave us the Giulia. And as a result, not only does it look similar, but it shares a lot in terms of technology, trim and engine choice. This was actually Alfa Romeo's first ever SUV. And in the cut and thrust world of modern car sales, a lot was riding on it. Happily, though this car is now beginning to show its age in a few areas, Alfa Romeo absolutely nailed some of the fundamentals. First off, it's a real looker. As SUVs go, I think this has to be one of the prettiest out there. The Italians seem to understand better than anyone else the value of making a car look good. In fact, I think it was looks alone that kept the Giulietta and Mito going for quite so long. This is also sized just right. It's about the same footprint as a Discovery Sport, a Jaguar E-Pace and fractionally bigger than a Kia Sportage, which is a useful benchmark because that's Britain's best selling car. The lineup is also refreshingly old school. In fact, excluding the top of the range Quadrifoglio, there are just three trims and three different engine options. No hybrid, no electric, just choose petrol or diesel. That's it. At the bottom of the range, you have the entry level Sprint. At the top, you have the saucily named Extrema. In the middle, you've got this, the Veloce, which is available with two engines, a 210 horsepower 2.2 litre diesel, or this, the four cylinder turbocharged 280 horsepower petrol, as you'd find in the Giulia Veloce. Base price, this is £56,000 and there isn't a lot in the way of options to choose. In fact, the main ones on this car are the very nice blue paint and the electrically opening sunroof, which between them add about two grand to the price. So it's not particularly cheap as cars go. Though I would love to say, unlike the Germans, here your car is fully loaded as standard, that's simply not the case. So what do you get with the Veloce trim? Well, you get these very nice looking 20 inch alloy wheels. You also get parking sensors front and rear, though just a basic reversing camera. However, for petrol head brownie points, you do get a proper mechanical limited slip differential. And in the UK, all Stelvios come as standard with an eight speed ZF gearbox and all wheel drive. Historically, it's been in the interior where some modern Alphas have really let the side down. Not here though, I am very happy to say that Alfa Romeo have finally broken free of the awful interiors that blighted their cars for the last decade. And we see a grand return to cars that once again feel like somewhere you want to spend a little bit of time and have a touch more personality than the German competition, even if in some ways they are a little bit more basic. Switch gear is somewhat haphazard and a few features you might expect are missing. In 2020, the Stelvio and Giulia were both facelifted and it's in here that the biggest differences can be seen. This Veloce model has these leather covered sport seats which are nice to look at and sit in. The quality of the leather is excellent and they've worn their miles so far very well. Bear in mind, this is a press car, they have a hard life. The only issue that I've had with them is the fact that when I have my seat a little further forward, as is Italian car tradition, the bolster on the right side does cut into my thigh but that might just be me. They are electric and also heated, though they don't have massage or ventilation or anything like that. But in a car like this, I can just about forgive it. The base stereo is very good, though an upgraded Harman Kardon option is also available. 
also introduced with the 2020 facelift was an all new TomTom based infotainment, which finally supported Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It works reasonably well. Truth be told, most of the time I just have Android running and I ignore the rest of it. It is far better than the old system and to me, well worth the price of a newer car on its own. Here, things are much the same as they were before, but you've got an extra menu for the center display and things are pretty much business as usual, if a little bit basic for a car made in 2022. Highlights for me include this steering wheel, which is beautifully trimmed, has the best logo in the world. I mean, which other manufacturer has a creature eating a man as their logo? Tell me, please. These wonderful long aluminum shift paddles that are fixed to the column, like in a Ferrari. Even the gear lever down here, which is a little bit Group FCA, has been trimmed in slightly nicer leather than before and crucially has the gear change icons the correct way around. Pull down to change up, like a race car, which obviously this is. Space in the back seats is reasonable. Four, six for adults will manage to squeeze in here, though it will be a squeeze. Boot space, I will admit, is a touch disappointing. For a car of this size, I expect it better. It's not helped by that dramatic rear roof line, the same as in many other SUVs now. However, for most people, I'd say it's adequate. So then on paper, the Stelvio, I think, is a pass. It's a C minus, a could do better, because though it is very pretty and has a little bit of Italian style about it, the price is on the high side, the features list is on the low side, and if you want to buy a new one, it does mean going to an Alfa Romeo dealer, who are some of the worst in the entire world. I have only ever had bad experiences at them. So. Could this possibly be a car good enough to drive that I'd be convinced to give them a second chance? Let's see. The sense of excitement in the automotive world around the release of the Giulia and subsequently the Stelvio was palpable for several very good reasons. First off, only a few years earlier, we'd had the 4C and everybody had pinned their hopes on that car to be the one that revived the Alfa Romeo brand. Then when it turned up, I think it's fair to say that most people agreed it wasn't anywhere near as good as we'd hoped. And for many manufacturers, that'd be the point where they go, right, okay, sod it. Let's not bother with anything else exciting again and go back to what we were doing before. But not for Alfa Romeo and certainly not for the boss of FCA, Sergio Marchioni, who decided he wanted Alfa to be capable of taking on the Germans. So he set up a skunkworks division of people, including Ferrari's chassis engineer behind the 458 Speciale, one Philip Kreef, and said to them, go build us a saloon car and then a spin-off SUV. Alpha also seemed to be acutely aware that they needed to appeal to petrol heads more than anybody else. So I suspect it's for that reason the first cars actually announced were the hot versions. Most manufacturers introduced the cooking model first, followed a couple of years later by the spicy version, but not Alpha. The first Giulia and Stelvio released was the Quadrifoglio. There was a Ferrari derived, though they weirdly denied that, turbocharged V6 driving the rear wheels in the Giulia and all of them in the Stelvio. And this was all packaged in a rather appealing body shell. Okay, the Stelvio is pretty, but the Giulia was drop dead gorgeous. And when journalists finally got their hands on these cars, we found out at long last, this was an Alpha that was not a dud. The Giulia Quadrifoglio was a performance saloon that could not be ignored. Not really a return to form for Alfa Romeo, instead a new high. Why am I talking about this model so much when that's not the one I'm reviewing? Well, because I got to drive a Giulia Quadrifoglio very early on. And like most people, one of the things that first struck me was the steering. It was incredibly darty, unsurprising perhaps when you let the man behind the 458 Speciale do what he likes. However, I never really conceived that the regular cars would be anything like that. My first experience of a cooking version of either was actually a Stelvio not that long after, driven of all places in Pennsylvania, courtesy of a lovely man called Alan who I hope is watching, because he was very, very kind to me a long time ago. He had a car much like this, but an earlier version. I hopped in it for a little bit, and I could not believe it. It steered like the Julia, had that hyperactive helm that the Quadrifoglio did, and 
I was absolutely aghast and quite frankly somewhat shocked that Alpha dared to let normal car buyers have steering like this because it's something else. When people say it's, it's darty, they mean it. I'm talking sort of F12 levels of dartiness. The 430 is nowhere near this pointy. It's a little bit nuts. However, in normal mode, there isn't quite so much feel from the wheel, and because it's so sharp, you're almost robbed a little bit of the opportunity to feel just how good and interactive the chassis is. As it turns out, much of the rest of the car is like that too. There are moments of brilliance and moments of confusion. Let's take the engine. 280 horsepower, 400 newton meters, which is 295 pound foot of torque or something along those lines, and it's okay. And I really mean that. It's okay. I haven't bothered putting an exhaust cam on today because we're not going to get any nice noises from it. It's a straight for turbo engine that doesn't really rev all that high. In fact, the red line starts at five and a half. The idle is also coarse enough that when I started this car, I genuinely stopped it, got out and checked the filler flap to make sure they hadn't sent me a diesel, but they hadn't. The car does have a reasonable spread of torque. If we put it now to about 2,500 RPM, put our foot down, it will pull nicely. It's certainly not lacking for grunt, though I really do wish it spun a little bit higher. Anybody who has fond memories of the old Alpha Busso or even their twin spark items is going to be very disappointed with this. It just doesn't have any real fizz or character about it which I can forgive to some extent as the cooking version. After all, if you want the spicy engine, you buy the spicy car. Turning circles, not all that bad in this. But, and this is somewhat unforgivable, in the entire time that I've had this car, I've averaged just 27 and a half MPG. In fact, until I did about 200 miles on the motorway, cruising at 70 today, it was actually closer to 26. And that's just not good enough. I've never really been all that convinced that from a consumer perspective, downsizing actually works. And this car is somewhat proving that theory true. Let's now talk about something a little cheerier, the gearbox, because it's brilliant. Yes, it may be the eight speed ZF that appears in just about anything else. And I've known quite a few people say they don't want the Julia because of it, but seriously, it's amazing. Alfa Romeo have calibrated this thing brilliantly. Around town, it is smooth enough, though the combo of engine and gearbox when pulling away from a junction do struggle just a little bit. Put the car into dynamic mode, flick the lever left for manual, and this thing is very, very nice. Downshifts actioned instantly, and upshifts when you're on it, they're snapped through with an almost DCT-like verve. Very impressed with Alfa Romeo here. Very impressed indeed. Of the other manufacturers who use this gearbox, I think it's only BMW that get it quite this right too. Watch, here we go, foot down and... Brilliant. I, I, that was an exaggeration, I was showing you when the thing was changing, but look, downshift. Brilliant. Get some revs on it, upshift and... <laughs> Alfa Romeo, blooming heck! Again, this is something you get in the Quadrifoglio, which I hoped for there and was very pleased when I got it, but simply did not expect in the regular version. Let's chuck this car into a bend. Power down. Oh, The last week I've been driving this car has chiefly been on quite narrow roads. These I tend to classify as narrow, but I think I'm going to forgive them because they're actually pretty generous. You have actually pretty good visibility, often through the corners and also to the fields. The roads I've just been on, a lot of deer, a lot of deer, so you have to be very, very careful. You can chuck this thing around a bend like it's a hot hatch. The all-wheel drive system does its job fairly well, but to be honest, it's 23 degrees, bone dry, and the car's got 280 horsepower. I don't think it's really going to worry all that much. I think, though, he might think that this road is a little bit narrow. Anyway, good excuse to put my foot down and find how well this car performs. Oh, oh. crikey. 
yeah, get the car to five and a half. It will go a little bit further, but it really starts cutting power very dramatically at that point. That's a shame. That's a real, real shame there. Suspension. Now that's an interesting one. I think to not fit this car with adaptive dampers is a mistake, particularly at this price point. Speaking of which, price point is a little bit confusing. I double checked the document Alfa Romeo sent me with the spec sheet of this car, and it's the least detailed spec sheet any manufacturer has ever sent me. There's really not much on it at all. But they quote the price of this car as optioned at £54,000. However, the Alfa Romeo configurator today gives me the same car at £57,000. The only options on this car, I double checked, are the blue paint, that's about 700 quid, the sunroof, that's 1250, and this has the driver assistance plus pack, that's a thousand pounds and gets you what you imagine, lane keep assist, that sort of stuff. And that all works quite well. You can also turn it off very easily. And of all the systems I've driven, I'd say this is actually one of the less intrusive, particularly in a car that's as broad as this. Though it isn't a particularly long car, and technically speaking, not a very large one, it feels massive. And I double checked the dimensions to see why. The answer is simple. It's very, very wide. 1.9 meters without the wing mirrors, 2.1 with them. Mmm. It was nerve wracking driving this thing on occasion. Really, really nerve wracking. And like the Lexus I had recently, because you've got that very stylish front end, you don't really have much concept of where that corner of the car is. And that's a shame. But we were talking suspension, weren't we? Yeah, in this car, it is passive. And in some ways, it's set up very well. But that's provided you're looking for a sporty and engaging drive. Because on the sort of comfort to sporty spectrum, this sits a little bit closer to sporty than it does comfy. Makes it great fun for this sort of stuff, having a little bit of a hoon. Though I must confess, this is one of the few times I've actually done this in this car because of the size of it. Like I said, all the roads I've spent my time in this week haven't really been suitable for this kind of stuff in a car this big. Give me a Mini Cooper and I'd have had bags more fun. I suppose that's not entirely Alpha's fault. People want great big cars these days, but I do feel like they could have made it a little bit narrower, a little bit. Around town, the car can be a little bit unsettled, and if you're gonna be using this mostly for urban stuff, or you're not the sort of person interested in pressing on, I recommend buying either the entry-level car with the smaller alloys, or the Extrema with its adaptive dampers that I'm sure also have a more comfortable mode too. Road noise also isn't brilliant. Not terrible, but it's there. The seats, longer I spend in them, more I like them, particularly after I discovered it actually has adjustable bolsters, though the button is really, really well hidden, and um, they can grip you quite nicely, these things. I like them a lot. The driving position itself is fairly decent. Your view of the display is uninterrupted, which I appreciate. Forwards is okay, though the A pillar is on the chunky side. The B pillar, though, is in the way. So for that reason, I'm thankful for the blind spot assist. The accelerator pedal is like many a modern car where it doesn't really seem to respond to your inputs all that linearly. However, that's not the one I have issues with. Perhaps my biggest gripe with this car is the same as in all the Julias I've driven the brakes. For reasons I still have yet to fathom, Alfa Romeo fitted these cars with brake by wire. So there is no physical connection between your foot and the brakes. And I do not know how they've got it quite so wrong, but they've managed it. These are so unnatural, so unintuitive, they really are most frustrating. Even for an experienced driver, they're incredibly difficult to modulate, and on a number of occasions I've found myself pulling up to a junction and putting the car a little bit too far forward, or not far forward enough. And that frustrates. I've driven cars from the last 100 years, and pretty much every single one of them I've been able to make it stop where I tell it to. Not these, though. Even worse than that, when you're having fun, go to scrub off a little bit of speed, you put your foot down and sometimes you'll move the pedal, but it doesn't really feel like the car's doing all that much. And this means that you don't really ever have an idea of how much brake you've really got in reserve. You've no idea what you're asking of the car, what it's got left. That's frustrating. 
something I would have thought Alfa Romeo would just get right. But they didn't. The sunroof I do really like, though with it open, it is just a little bit noisier here than I would like. Similarly, the infotainment system down here, though it is much better than the last one, everything about it is just a little bit laggy. Even simple stuff like turning up and down the fan or the temperature, it's just not responsive in a way that it really should be. This is simple, simple stuff. We mastered this years ago. And then bizarrely, Alpha gave us a stereo that for a base one is actually really quite good. So, should you buy an Alfa Romeo Stelvio Veloce? Wow. That's an interesting question. If you really want this car, if you've got your heart set on an Alpha, do it. If you can live with the Julia, get that, because for me, it is the better package. However, if you feel the need for an SUV, I'm very happy to say that though there are certainly gripes with this car, the later one is definitely an improvement. Get the facelift 2020 onwards model if you can. There's very little in this car that I would call a deal breaker. And that really is a very, very big thing for Alfa Romeo, considering their past performance. This is also almost certain to be the last purely combustion engine powered Alfa SUV because the Giorgio platform on which this was based has now been retired. One of the reasons for that being the fact that they made no provision for hybrid. The new Tonali, their smaller SUV, is already a hybrid and whatever replaces this is almost certainly going to be as well, as is the new Julia, if we get one. Uh, get used to visiting this place, by the way, if you buy one of these. But if you've not got your heart set on an Alfa Romeo and you just want a decent, feature-packed, easy-to-use, daily drivable, practical, all-rounder SUV, shop elsewhere. Because though this car has a charm, it doesn't have the complete package. A shame, but you know what? That is very Alfa Romeo. A big thank you to Alfa Romeo for lending me this car. A big thanks to my friends Anthony and Damani from Sports and Touring, who've also done a second opinion piece on this car and the drive-by shots you've seen. Check out their channel and my new one, JM and Friends. And don't forget, as always, hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.